Your task is to model and document a two-story single dwelling in Autodesk Revit, utilizing correct modeling workflows and procedures as demonstrated in class tutorials. Upon completion of the assessment task, you'll submit to Student Web an Autodesk Revit.rvt model file and a combined A2 drawing pack in PDF format with the following drawings. There will be a total of five sheets, beginning with a cover sheet, which includes type schedules for doors and walls, general notes, site plan at 1 to 200, and two 3D perspective views, one for interior and exterior. The second sheet will be a general arrangements floor plan sheet with both the ground and the first floor plans at a scale of 1 to 100. The third sheet will be building elevations for north, east, south and west at 1 to 100. The fourth sheet will be sections and details which will include one building section at 1 to 50 and two details one uh, at 1 to 20 which include both wall ceiling and floor details and wall to floor and footing details. The fifth and final sheet will be a set of miscellaneous drawings which will include a reflected ceiling plan or an RCP just for the ground floor at 1 to 100 and two exploded axonometric views using two methodologies, one with the section box tool and the others with the exploding tool. And the final drawing will, will be an internal elevation of the kitchen joinery unit at, one to, at a scale of 1 to 50. You'll find references for this assessment task on Student Web under the Revit two-story house assessment task module. And they include a reference set of plans and a facade reference in JPEG format. A quick disclaimer, it's a prerequisite before starting this assessment task that you go watch my Revit fundamentals and interface tour um, with the link in the description below. This is a presentation that I commonly give to industry, whether it be architects, engineers, builders, or even clients, on the absolute fundamentals and background of Autodesk Revit, uh, including what is BIM more broadly, as well as the key concepts to understand within Revit, uh, as well as a, a generic or a basic interfaces tour. You'll find the assessment task ramps up rapidly and having that intimate knowledge of the user interface and of the fundamental principles of Revit will greatly assist you in getting the most out of this assessment task. Once Revit is open, you'll land on the home page and the home page may look different depending on which version of Revit that you're using. On the left hand side, you'll see I have the option to open up new models or to create new models and then the same commands repeat for families, open up existing families or make new families. And then underneath of that, you've got this area here, which has to do with Autodesk's construction cloud. If I've got a model that's saved in the cloud, um, that's something that we'll go through a little bit later on in this course. And then over here, you just essentially have the previous models that have been opened and the previous families that have been opened. But what we'll do is we're going to open up the basic um, the basic Revit architecture model, um, which is like a, a demo model essentially. So just click on that file and that will open up. And then when that opens up, that will open by default to a, a sheet view. So as depicted in my Revit fundamentals and interface uh, video that you've watched, the interface is broken up into tabs which are uh, which tend to be uh, more discipline based than anything uh, and we'll go through those tabs shortly you then have the ribbon itself and the ribbon dynamically updates depending on which tab is currently selected you then have the project browser the properties window and then the modeling space or model space or the modeling window in the center going through each of those in a little bit more detail so i'm just going to go firstly to my project browser the project browser is broken up really into views, sheets predominantly, but then also legends, schedules, families, and links. And to activate a view, I simply just double click on the view that I want. So this is an American project. So level one is, is ground, level two is our level one and so on. But same with like an elevation, I double click on the north elevation and that activates that view inside of my model space or my viewport. And if we keep going down, you then have legends, which in this project, there are no legends. Underneath of that, you've got schedules, where again, in this project, there aren't many schedules. And then underneath of that, 
you've got the sheets area and the sheets area is much like paper space inside of AutoCAD. So you place different views onto sheets, you drag them onto sheets. And you can see that here on the site plan, you've got a solar analysis and the site plan itself, which has been dragged onto this sheet at a certain scale. And the sheets, are, um, uh, this title block is an A1 title block, but you'll have the option to create, you know, all sorts of different size title blocks in whatever style that you so wish to. So I can minimize, in fact, it might help if I right click on where it says views all, I'm gonna say collapse all and that brings it back. So the project browser is made up of views, legends, schedules, sheets, families, groups, and finally Revit links. And I can choose to just double clicking on them, we'll open that up. And then the way that the default project browser, at least in this file is structured, is that it will show us all the floor plans, then all the 3D views, then all the elevations, and they're sort of stacked up underneath each other in, in like a, in a um, data tree. This can be customized depending on the project or depending on the template that you're using. Really, it doesn't matter. It just the method in which you navigate um, is always consistent, always stays the same. So I'm just going to go to level one, go to a ground floor. So it activates my uh, ribbon. So when I'm in a sheet, because I can't draw, much like in AutoCAD, I can't draw directly onto a sheet. You'll notice that the ribbon goes grey. But when I'm in a live view, the ribbon is the ribbon is activated. So each of these tabs will then, like I said, change the um, ribbon dynamically. So starting with architecture, then structure, steel, systems, and goes on. Uh, annotate everything two-dimensional all the way through to manage. Um, some of you may have other tabs in here. Some of you may have one called precast for precast concrete. And there are some in here that you're not going to have, like Revisto or Derophus or Rhino inside of Revit. These are custom plugins that I just happen to have, like extra softwares that I have. But you know, it doesn't really matter. We're not going to be using any of these in this course. So the really, some of these tabs, I'm not expecting us to, to learn them all. In fact, it would be impossible to learn them all in this course. I mean, people's entire careers are based around just some of these tabs as well, like the the structure tab is completely what a structural engineer would use. The systems tab, this is MEP, so mechanical, uh, plumbing and piping and electrical. I mean, people's entire careers are based around just this electrical section or uh, the section or just this HVAC section. So it's a, obviously it's a vast and wide program software to learn. The next thing to look at is sort of how to activate a command. And this goes for any command in general. So in the architecture tab, if I just hold my mouse over say the wall, it will give me a, I'm not clicking on anything that's hovering my mouse over it. It will give me a short description of what the command is. And in brackets, it will also tell me the, the shortcut for that command as well. So for wall, the shortcut is WA. For door, the shortcut is DR. Window is WN and so on and so forth. But some of them will, all show you, will also show you how to actually use that command. So say with the floor, you'll see here, does it show us... No, I think um, shaft will, though. if I hold my mouse over shaft. No, some of these have videos as well that will sort of play. I think this one does. Yep, you can see there's a video playing there of how to use the wall opening tool. So there'll be both a, um, there'll be a demonstration, at least an image, sometimes a video demonstration, and then there is a description placed there. The wall opening you'll see here doesn't actually have a shortcut command, so it just says wall opening and that's it. There's no... Um, command for me to plug in to type in now that goes to my second the second point which is in order to activate a command I'm much more of a, a shortcuts person I encourage you to be likewise you don't type in a command and then hit spacebar or enter the command just activates once you type in the the keys on the keyboard so for wall I just go wa on my keyboard and you'll see that my mouse changes and my wall drawing uh, modification tools are now activated and so with a wall, I'll just click once to start, move my hand down, click again. And then in order to end a command, I can hit escape once. And what happens there is it will stop me from say drawing a wall or placing a door, but that command is still activated. You can see my, my ribbon hasn't changed. It's still in like the modify place wall ribbon. But if I hit, if I hit escape one more time, so in other words, hit escape twice, it exits the command completely. And you'll see now I'm just back to my normal selection tool. This is the same principle for everything else. So let's try door. I click on door. So I can either click on the button and click on door. And I'm just going to choose a double door. And I'll place that like so. Or on the other side. 
and that's now placed those doors. I can hit escape once and I'm still in the command. I'm just not placing a door until I hold my mouse over the wall. Or if I hit escape again, now the door has the door command has now switched off. And now I can do the same thing with the window. With the window, I'll go WN on my keyboard and that's fine. I'll just take that window there and I'll just click it and put it into a wall as an example. Hit escape twice, the command's now ended. That's the general method in which you um, activate commands and deselect them. And again, I would encourage you to use the um, Revit shortcuts. And there's a there's a resource on Student Web listing all of the different shortcuts. However, the most important ones, I'll be mentioning them throughout this course, and I encourage you to write them down just for your own reference. So let's now go into our 3D view and take a look at just how to navigate in Revit. So firstly, well, actually, first, let's take a look how to navigate in 2D. Navigating 2D is exactly like CAD. So the scroll wheel to zoom in and out, Hold down the scroll wheel or middle mouse button to pan around your view, exactly the same as AutoCAD. To go to the 3D view, I'm gonna to go to my project browser and come down to where it just says 3D here, and I'll double click on that, and that opens up my 3D view. So in order to orbit in 3D, you hold down Shift and middle mouse, and then you orbit around, and sort of like how in Rhino you use zoom select, in Revit you just click on an item and when you click on that item it becomes the center point of your rotation. And as you can guess, scrolling the, um, the, the scroll wheel um, is how you zoom in and out. And then just holding down the middle mouse button is how you pan around. Finally, in this brief interface tour, we'll take a look at the properties window. So nothing is currently selected. And on the right hand side, I have my properties window. And the properties window shows data associated to a selected element. Um, and it, it, it presents both reporting parameters um, or you can input instance parameters. Well, you know, if I click on edit type, it will show me the type based properties for that relevant element. And the, this, this, um, this properties window and edit type looks different depending on what objects that I select. So to give an example, with nothing selected, it's giving me the properties for the actual 3D view itself that we're currently looking at. But if I was to click on this wall, let's say, so I'll click on that wall, it's now telling us what type of wall it is. It's a basic wall, a SIP wall. It tells us a bunch of data about the location line, its base constraint, its height, and then you can see these elements here that are grayed out. These parameters are what's called reporting parameters. I can't change them because it's just reporting what is. I can't lie. The length of that wall is 19.2 meters. It's 43 meters squared and has a volume of 8.1 cubic meters. If I click on edit type, you can see that looks much different now to how it looked um, previous when I was just clicking on the selected view. So again, if I hit uh, get out of here, hit escape, and let's click on a window this time, click on the glass, you can see some of these parameters update because it's just relevant for the window versus a wall. And when I click on edit type, um, if you pause the screen from before, you'll notice these parameters are different as well. So it's not the same parameters that show. Remember, anything that shows in the properties window, these are instance based parameters, either reporting or I can change them and edit type shows me the type based parameters and for a true definition of the difference between type and instance based go back and watch my Revit fundamentals and interface to a video. One more disclaimer before you start this course each week I will go through a number of workflows and commands taking you through not just how to draw elements but to customize and modify them too. However I will continue to layer and add more content and context in rising complexity as the course progresses. I will continue to reference back to past commands, but touch on other workflows and content. It would not make sense to go through all 50 parameters for walls in class one when we only need to adjust five. In other words, if you see repeating topic titles over, over the course duration, pay attention and review them because it's highly likely to be something completely new, not covered in the previous workshops. Upon opening up Revit and landing on the home page, I'm going to come over to the left hand side and click to create a new model. I'll then be prompted to choose a Revit template and if your practice that you're working for has a template file, this is usually where you would find that. In this scenario, we're just going to choose the standard architectural template. We're going to create a new project and then we'll hit OK. So I'll just give that a second and that's now opened up and it opens up by default to the ground floor. Uh, view of uh, Revit. So from here, what we're going to do firstly is bring in our background, our, our JPEG image of our floor plan uh, to use as reference. 
So I'm going to come across to the insert tab and then in the insert tab, this is where we can uh, either, you know, actually insert other items um, such as images or um, PDFs um, or CAD files, or you can link them as well. So you can link other Revit files, link IFC files, link CAD files, um, etc. even point clouds. In this scenario, I'm just going to click on images and I'll get a, a, a dialog box that will prompt me to find the image I want to uh, import. And I'm just going to navigate to my well, to today's class and choose the floor plan. So I've just opened up the uh, PDF set of floor plans and then taken a screenshot and saved it as a JPEG image because this will work much better with the floor plans as a JPEG image rather than the original PDF. So I'll just click open and then it's just going to follow my mouse around and I can chuck this wherever I want. So I'm just going to just click once over here. And there's my floor plans now loaded into the project just as a JPEG image. The whole point of this is to then now trace these um, these plans. So we need to scale these drawings or scale these plans. Um, you, this is much like the way that we started off with our Rhino assessment task. The process is a little bit different here, but nonetheless, we still do need to go through the process of scaling. So at the moment, the, I'm not sure how big this floor plan is at all, no, not a clue. But as always, we should just start with a reference um, to give us some idea of how to rescale the drawing. So in this instance, I'm going to start with... Um, well, let, I reckon the front door is probably the best one. So it's probably an, a 920 front door. Uh, I don't know for sure, but we'll try a few different methods. Like we'll, we'll, we'll double check the scaling of a few items in the building so we get a rough idea. Again, this is just a guideline for us. We'll end up rationalizing the building uh, as we go along. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to click on the uh, click onto the uh the JPEG image and I'm going to use the shortcut RE. So I'm just going to hit RE on the keyboard and remember that you don't have to hit enter in Revit. You just type in the, the command and it will automatically activate that command. Um, or if you want to use the toolbar, I'll click on the JPEG image and then in my modify panel, I'm going to click on this button here, which is scale. So when I click on that, it's now going to prompt me to choose the first point that I want to scale from. So I'm going to zoom right into the door and you can see the closer I get, you know, this image is a pixelated JPEG image. So we can see all the way down to the pixel base. So it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be close. So I'm going to click one side of this door frame. So I'll go from, oh, sorry, the door leaf. I'm going to go from, say, just there. And I'm going to come all the way up to the top of the door leaf. And at the moment, you can see the length of that door leaf is 3.2 meters. I'm going to click again and drag this back down. And in fact, I can even type in a number, but I would say this door leaf is probably a 920 door leaf. So I can just come down to where it says 920 and then click. And now the door leaf has, or the, the plans themselves have shrunk to be that size. And we can double check some of these um, just by using the, uh, the measurement tool. So across the very top of Revit, the very top, the, very, the highest um, toolbar, there's this little tape measure here measure between two references and I can just click on that and let's take a look here. So I'm going to just click on this side of the door and move my hand up to this side of the door and it's around 920 ish. That's fine. Let's try again. Let's do that again. So I'll grab another reference, another measuring tape and let's go across the breakfast bench and see what this is. So from this point here to this point here, it's about 923, 924. Inside, inside, 900. Yeah, it should be around 900. That's good. And then even some of these internal doors. So let's say, for instance, this door going to the laundry. Well, actually, we'll go up to the bedrooms because we know they'll probably be 820 doors. So I'll click on this point here to this point here, and that's 920. So I reckon that these are probably eight. Very rare you'd have 920 doors for an internal bedroom door. So I reckon we need to make this drawing smaller again. So I reckon the front door is not a 920 door. It's probably an 820 door. So let's go again. So I'm going to click on the reference image, go RE on the keyboard. I'm going to do the same thing again. Zoom right into the corner of the door, come to the top of the door, just say there. And then instead of 920 or 930, I'm just going to type in 820 and hit spacebar or enter. And that's now completed. Now I feel much more confident that that is the real size of the drawing. And let's just do one more reference. 
across the kitchen table. Yeah, an 800, 900 wide kitchen um, breakfast bench, that's about right. The reason why we don't need it to be absolutely perfect is because when we start drawing around um, and, and filling in these walls, we'll end up dimensioning them and rationalizing them. Now, you don't have to make them the same dimension as uh, as the example or as my example that you're going to see here. I don't really mind as long as they're rationalized and we'll go through that shortly. So now that that's complete, what I need to do is just click and drag this somewhere around here. I'm going to make the ground floor somewhere around the center here. All right, and that's enough. And then I'm going to pin this image. So I'm going to drag this to about there. And then I'm going to pin it. So I'm going to click on the uh, JPEG image and you can either type in the command PN for pin or when I click on the JPEG image in the modify panel you'll see this little pin here and I click that and now the drawing is pinned it's essentially the same thing as lock in Rhino so I can click on it but I can't move it you can see it, no matter what I do I click and drag it's not going anywhere so that's the first thing now complete the next thing that you have to do when you set up your Revit models is you actually, it's a little bit different to how Rhino works or even you know, any other 3D software where you can essentially start modeling however you want, wherever you want. Revit is much more rules based uh, or there's much more of a methodology to how you model. So the next stage, you would think probably you would just start drawing walls and that is okay, but really, especially if we're doing a large project, it's very hard to move walls to different locations later on in the project. So we want to try and ascertain um, our levels as fast as possible. So I'm just going to click on our north elevation. And you'll see when I double click on the north elevation, we now have a ground floor and a level one at this point. We're going to move these um, to a relevant level, um, to an RL reference or um, a reduced level. And that will be where our walls, our doors, our floors, everything is hosted to a level inside of Revit. It's kind of like a it's kind of like a seaplane in Rhino, but it's not at the same time because seaplanes firstly are just, you know, individual references. You can lie you can essentially drag whatever you want to whatever height you like. It's not gonna it's not gonna break on you or anything like that. And the seaplanes don't hold any metadata. Levels in Revit are like a an invisible object. So they actually hold data within them and items are hosted to them as well. So I'm going to click on the level and then click on the number where it says zero. And I'm going to type in 54650. So 54 meters, 650 millimeters and hit enter. Now that should just disappear off the page. And that's because that's gone way up here. And then level one, I'm just going to click and drag and move that to be above, something like that. And I, and at this point, I don't even care what that number is right now. We'll work on that a little bit later. So now our levels are in the correct place. So I'm going to come back to my ground floor plan. And next thing to do is to start creating some of our walls. So the first thing to look at is how to, I reckon, how to draw a wall and then how to modify walls. And this process is the same no matter what type of wall it is. If it's a concrete precast wall, if it's a curtain wall, if it's a timber stud wall, steel stud wall, a SIPS panel, a firewall, or if in this case, a brick veneer wall. So I'm going to go to the architecture tab and click on just the first button, which is walls. Or the shortcut is WA. When I click on that, my arrow turns in these cross hairs and I have the ability just to click and drag and now I'm drawing a wall of some sort. And click once to start, once to stop. I can click again and type in a number and so on and so forth. I went through this previously in the quick interface tour. But nonetheless, uh, taking a, a closer look at the walls in the properties window. So at the moment, this is a double brick 270 wall. Now, if I click on that, on that name, you'll see this drop down box appears. And these are all the walls currently in the project. And these are just the standard walls that come with Revit out of the box. The reason why some of these numbers are a little bit, well, actually the numbers are quite rational, but some of them are a little bit, um, a little bit different um, is because there is like this direct swap from the Imperial system to the metric system. So don't be surprised if you see some odd numbers every now and again. But we can start with a brick veneer 250 wall. So when I click on that, it changes the wall type now, at the moment, we can't tell because it's just this gray 
this gray line or this gray thick line. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to the bottom of my modeling window and change the detail level from coarse to fine. And what that does is we can now see the makeup of that wall here. So the brick is on the outside, the air gaps in the middle, and the, tim uh, the timber stud is on the inside. The other thing you'll notice as well is when I click on that wall, in underneath of the property windows, we then have um, underneath, sorry, the, the type of wall is all the properties pertaining to that wall. So we drew that from the wall center line. And what this means, the, the, the location and line of the wall is actually really important. Um, what that means is, is you can quickly tell because when I click on the wall, you get this little blue dot here and this little blue dot there, and you'll notice they're in the, cyst in the center of the wall. So it means that when I drew this wall, if I go and click wall again and I start drawing, notice my mouse is following through the guts of the wall. If I change that, so if I click on the location line, a drop down box appears and I can, there's a multitude of options to, to draw walls, either from the core center line or the wall center line finish face of the exterior, finish face of the interior of the wall, and then the core interior and exterior. The difference between core and then like the wall face itself, I'll go through shortly. But pretty often I tend to draw from the finish face exterior, though each methodology has its own purpose and its own time where it's relevant. So if I click on finish face exterior and do that again, notice that as I draw, I'm drawing on the brick side. My mouse is, is relevant to the face of the brick. Oh, that's a double brick wall. So let me just change that quickly again. You'll see when I change that, the timber is on the inside and the bricks on the outside. I'll do that again. I'll make sure I choose the right wall and let's change it to the finished base interior. And you'll see I'm drawing from the timber side like so. And this matters because when we go to change wall types, it changes from that point. So if I, st if I stick these two next to each other, I'll just align them. Okay, and I change this to say um, a generic 300 millimeter wall here. Watch what happens. It grows from the bottom up, but this one here, I do that again, click the 300, it grows from the top down because it goes from the point that the wall was drawn or the reference to the location line the wall was drawn and will grow from there. If I do that again, I'll take, I'll go back, I'll make another copy. And this time I'm going to click on this because you can change this retrospectively too. So it doesn't matter if you chose to draw the walls a certain way, you can always click on that wall later and change its location. So I'll change this one to the wall center line. So watch what happens now. So this one's from the finished face exterior. So I'll change that to a 300 millimeter wall and it grows downwards because I drew from the exterior. This one I drew from the interior. So it's going to grow upwards like so. And this one's from the center line of the wall. So when I change this, it will grow evenly top and bottom, as you can see there. Now, this is really powerful, especially when you're doing like um, apartments or something like that. And you want to change that or you have to change the thickness of a wall. If you're drawing it from a finished face exterior or interior, you'll notice this will become a real pain because you'll have doors that um, are on adjacent walls or you'll have items that are stuck to the wall or the walls, uh, the room will end up being crushed in size and make clearances, um, non-compliant and whatnot. So what you tend to do is you'll select all these walls and you can just change them there. You can say, well, actually all of these walls are drawn from the wall center line. So when you go to change the thickness of those walls, like here, I'll change this to a stud wall. They just shrink back towards the center of the wall or they grow from the center of the wall. But the reason why, I mean, you can draw from wall center line, but most of the time you've, it's easier to draw from one of the finished faces, either interior or exterior. Next up underneath of that, you've got the location of the wall. So notice here, the base constraint is the ground floor. And if I click on that, I can choose either the ground floor or the first floor at this point, but I can choose any level that's in this, in this project. So if there's 50 levels, I could choose from any one of those 50s. And that is where the wall starts from. So the base of the wall, and then you have the base offset. So what that means is, is if I go into a elevation, you can see here that this wall starts at the ground level, wherever that ground level is, whether it's 54, 50, um, 54.6 meters above um, sea level, or whether that moves. And in fact, if, even if I drag this, you can see the wall moves with it. 
because it's always hosted to the ground floor, wherever that is. But I can also give it a base offset. So I can say, actually, it's it starts on the ground floor, but it actually sits 500 millimeters above the ground floor like that. Or I can do the opposite. It sits 500 millimeters below the ground floor is where it starts. And then you'll see, I'm going to change that back to zero. And then you'll see that the height for that wall at the moment is unconnected. There's no constraint that's capping where that wall ends. I can say, uh, I can end it at level one and it will cut itself to be an equal level one. Or if it's unconnected, it's just whatever height that is. So at the moment, it's 5.1 meters, but I could make that, you know, 10 meters if I wanted to. Or again, I can say it goes up to level one, but then the top offset is it's minus 500. So it goes up to level one, which is, you know, five odd meters, and then it comes down 500, which means it will end at 4.6 meters. Or I can do the opposite. Say it's going to finish one meter above level one. And now the total height of that wall is 6.1 meters, as an example. Underneath of that, you have top is attached, which is a tick box. Some of these are grayed out. And the reason why they're grayed out is because um, at the moment, those parameters are not activated and that's fine. And then the other one is whether the wall is room bounding. 99.9% .9 of the time, that is room bounding and that's just by default. But I'll explain what that is when we start going through rooms. Under that is more for the analytical model. So is this wall a structural wall? Um, and at this point it's not. And you know we could find structural walls under the structure tab as well. So it's indifferent. Then underneath that, you've got some of the reporting, what you call pro reporting parameters. And this is updated in live time. So, and I can't change these because Revit can't lie. So the length of this wall is 10.8 meters and its area is 65 meters. The volume is 5.9. So if I change that back to a really thick wall, you'll see the volume immediately increases to 19.7 cubic meters. Great, if this was a concrete wall, I could calculate the amount of volume of concrete material that I need. Area is great. If you've got wall tiles, you say, okay, well, this wall is this long. We need 92 meters or 93 meters squared of wall tiles. And the length is obviously really important. You can see as I update this, it updates. So the height has now updated to 3.7 meters and the width has updated to 12.7 or 12.4 and the area has changed to 46 meters. But if I drag it up to here, the area increases to 103.9 square meters. Underneath of that is identity data. These are data fields that you can enter. They're blank by default. We'll leave them for now. And then the phasing that this wall was created. Again, we'll leave that for now. They're the main components that you have to consider when modeling walls. Now you can edit this either after <clears throat> either after you've drawn a wall, like we were just doing now, so retrospectively, or you can do it on the fly. So if I go and create another wall, you'll see under, when I when I activate the wall command, uh, the modify place wall tab activates, and that's why we have this green bar that shows. I've got my different sort of line types that I can use to draw a wall. So I can draw an arc or an ellipse wall, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it's just a straight line wall. But then underneath that, you've got the height or the depth. So you can say the height at the moment is unconnected and it's gonna be eight meters high. Or I can say it goes up to level one and leave it as that. You then have the location line. So you see that's the same thing as what we saw here, it's just that I can adjust it before I draw the wall here. The tick for the chain, so that means that, well, I'll show you what that means. If I start drawing, it's just going to continue drawing more walls as I click around and close off that wall and then cancel that out. Otherwise, if I don't change it, then it will stop after one wall and I have to re-hit the command again. Offset is pretty self-explanatory. So I'm drawing from the finish face exterior, but if I said 1500, it will be wherever my mouse is, which is great for like when I'm drawing adjacent to a wall. I can draw along here and you can see it's drawing 1.5 meters off of that. And then the radius is uh, a little bit different if I want to add a radius to that wall. Um, and then the join status at the moment is allow. But the join and not not um, disallow join, um, that modifying of a wall will go through again at a later stage. So that is how to draw walls in Revit. Next up, we'll go through how to edit the type of walls and create our custom wall types. Let's begin with the brick veneer exterior wall. So I'm going to start from this corner here at the laundry, come around to the right and then down to the bottom right hand corner at the living room. So I'm going to go wall and I'm going to choose my 250 millimeter brick veneer. I'm going to draw from the finish face interior 
Notice I'm changing it from the properties window, but I can easily just change it here too. Finish face interior. Uh, its height is going to go up to level one. That's fine. And that's basically all I need to know right now. So I'm just going to zoom in, click to start, and I don't care at all how long this wall is. I'm not going to type in a number. I'm just going to eyeball it, click once there, and then come down to the front corner of the house and just click there and then hit escape a couple times to end the command. So now I have our first two, we have our first two walls drawn uh, and it serves as a good basis from here. So let's uh, edit our brick veneer wall um, and then we'll continue to create more wall types um, after that. Um, but beginning with the brick veneer wall, so select it and then click, come over to the properties window and click edit type. When you click edit type, the properties window appears and for yourself, you may not see the preview. It may look something like this to bring up that preview of the wall cut. All I did is click this button down here, preview like so. And then within edit type, this is um, what the key differences between instance based properties and type based properties. So what we're editing here is the type based properties of this wall. So it is a wall that is a category of family and then this is a brick veneer 250 millimeter wall type so what we're going to do first is we're going to rename this because we this naming system is terrible so i'm going to click on rename and i'm going to utilize the naming convention i'm going to go wt01 so wall type one underscore it will be 250 mil thick 250 millimeters thick underscore and then we type in what the makeup of this wall is from exterior to interior. So it's made up of 110 mil brick, BR, forward slash, then it will be a 40 millimeter air gap, AG, forward slash, 90 millimeter timber stud, TS, forward slash, 10 millimeter plasterboard. And this will become more evident when you work in larger projects, but it doesn't, nowhere in Revit does it actually tell you when you click on a wall, what that wall is actually made of. What you would normally have to do is go into edit type and then click on this structure button here where it says edit and then read the list. That's a very slow method. So putting that uh, in the name of the wall makes it much easier. So all you gotta do is click on the wall and it will report back to you in the name what makes up that wall type. So I'm gonna go okay. So that's now updated. We can see that up the top here. And then in here, we're going to click on where it says structure, click on edit. And then in here is the layer or the assembly that makes up this wall type. Notice as well, starts from the exterior, works down to the interior. And this table here is that exact, is that exact thing. So you can see it starts with the finish. So, a fi so the function of the brick um, veneer is a finish. And we know that the brick veneer is not structural. It's just the finish and it's thickness 100 mil. And it does wrap. This wraps component will leave for now. We'll just um, we'll leave that as is. We can see that the thermal air barrier that is 50 mil. We're going to make that 40 mil. Okay, so when we do that, that updates here in the preview. In fact, if I go really exaggerate and I say it's 150 mil, watch the preview. So the preview updates as we update the model here or the the, the assembly. The timber stud is a structural element. But what we're going to do is I'm going to come down to Ed insert and I've inserted a new layer into this wall. At the moment it has a thickness of zero, but I'm going to click on where it says number two and then click on these buttons here to go down, 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 and then down again. So what this will be is under the function, I can click on that drop down box and you have a few options by default in Revit. Either it's a structure, it's a substrate, it's a thermal air layer, or it's one of two finishes or it's a membrane layer. In this instance, it's a finish layer. So I'm just gonna click on finish one. The material, when I click on that, it says by category currently. But when I click on that, I click on these three buttons here and it's gonna open up Revit's properties or material window. So I'm just gonna shrink that down. And it opens up this here. So Revit has a number of materials by default and we can, we can make our own as well. But what I am going to do for now is just search for plaster and we've got one there, so gypsum wall board. So I'll click on that and it's a white color uh, and that will do. So I'll go through the materials um, properties a little bit later on in the assignment. We don't really need to know right now. So I'll click okay. And then the thickness that I give to that wall will be 10 mil. So you see now we have our plasterboard layer just there. So plasterboard, the stud, the air gap and the brick. And you'll notice as well, 
it might be hard to see on the screen, but this line here and this line here is green. And the reason why that's green is that's telling us what the core of the wall is. And you remember before we could draw the wall from the core face or the finish face or the core center line or the wall center line. So what that actually means is the core generally means the structural element of the wall. Generally, there are some instances where it's not so. And this is actually one of the instances where it's not so. So we can move the core boundary by clicking on the first layer, which is number three. And I'm going to move that up. And when I do that, you'll notice now it might be hard to see, but this line's gone black and this line has turned green. So what we have is basically that the brick, the air layer, and the timber stud, that is in the core boundary, and then the finish is just the gypsum board or the, the, the plaster board. This may not make much sense now, but it definitely will when we start dimensioning the walls. So that's all we need to do right now, that's fine. And we're going to end up editing this wall type a little bit more later on. So you can, it, the important component is it's non-destructive. You can always edit as you go along. So I'll say, okay, that's now updated. I don't need to touch anything else here right now. And I'll go, okay. And when I do that, it looks like nothing's really happened. But if I zoom right in on that wall, and by the way, your walls may look something like this. You may have like thick lines turned on. In order to turn off those thick lines of the line weights, I just come up to the very, um, the, the, the very top toolbar. And about three from the right, there's this button here that's called thin lines or um, the shortcut is TL for toggle line weights. And I just type in TL on my keyboard and it flicks the line weights on and off. And you'll see when I flick the line weights off, we can see the plasterboard layer. And it's pretty standard practice that you just work with thick lines turned off or thin lines turned on, sorry, like this. Okay. So that's now done. That's our first wall type created. And we can keep editing these wall types as well. So I can keep drawing this wall. So I'm going to pick up on this wall here to come across the front face of the building. So I'm going to go C, I'm going to go um, a really good command to use. I'm going to click on the wall and go CS, which means create similar. So I click on the external wall here and just draw around here. Like so. That is going to work. Okay, so it just picks up the wall as it was. And the reason why CS or create similar is such a good command is because it picks up the properties of the last wall that you drew as well. You don't have to start typing in all those properties again. All right, that looks good. Next up, I'm going to edit. I'm going to create a, um, a double brick wall. So I'm going to go WT or WA for wall. I'm going to come down to my naming or my wall types. And I'm going to click on double brick 270. And I'm going to go edit type and let's do this again. So I'm going to change this. I'm going to rename this. I'm going to call this WT02 underscore. This will be 250, 260. Um, 110, 110. I'm going to call it 240mm. And then underscore again, I'm going to say 110 millimeter brick with a 20 mil air gap, AG forward slash 110 brick. Okay, whoops, that should have been wall type two, not wall type three. So I'm going to just click on rename and change that. And then under structure, I'm going to come back to here and play around with these again. So I'm going to take the core boundary and move that up and up. So it's at the very top of the stack. Notice I'm clicking on the number to change the location of these layers. Um, of the wall and you'll notice again that it says at the top of the table up here it says exterior side and then interior side down here so the finish first finish is masonry brick 110 mil thick the second one is an air uh, air gap i'm going to change that to 40 no i'm going to change that to 20 mil actually and you'll see this updates here and then another brick layer um, that's 110 mil thick i'm going to give those the same brick material though so i'm going to find the same masonry brown brick click ok so it looks something like this, and that is good to go. Now, it's going to ask here, it says structural material. I can tick one of these. So one of these could be the structural material, or it could be both. In this instance, it's the interior side that's the structural material. Click OK. I'm going to leave the rest of this for now, and then click OK. Now I can start drawing our uh, garage. So I'm just going to click once here, draw around there, 
do something like that. And I also need to do the front of the garage. So if I hit escape once, it will keep the command running. So I can go like that. If I hit escape twice, it ends the command. So again, let's pick up the brick veneer wall, CS for create similar. I'm just gonna click once here, drag along. And I'm gonna purposely not link these walls up because it will become a little bit appropriate shortly why that is. All right, so that looks pretty good for now. Next up, I'm going to create a steel a timber stud wall. So 90 mil timber stud wall type. Come down to stud timber 90. Click on that and then edit type again. Rename. This will be WT03 underscore 90. No, it's actually not. It's 110 millimeters underscore 10 millimeter plasterboard, 90 mil timber stud, 10 mil plasterboard. Edit the structure and let's add those in. So at the moment, the core boundary is just around the timber stud, which is fine. So it'll say insert and insert, and I'll move one of these. So I'll click on number two and move that up. So it's outside the core boundary. And number three, I'll click down and down. So it's outside the core boundary. Next up, we'll give it a thickness. So 10 mil for the top, 10 mil for the bottom. And you'll see that will replicate in the view here. And then we'll just give that the gypsum plasterboard by clicking on the little three dots. And gypsum plasterboard. Excellent. Uh, and change the function from a structure to a finish, finish one, and finish one. That looks good. Okay. And okay. And now I can start drawing away with these two. So I'm still drawing on the finish face interior in this area, in this instance. So I'm just going to come around and draw along here. And you'll see as soon as I intersect with another wall, it knows how to join the timber studs together. So I'm just drawing randomly here. There's nothing really too special that I'm doing here. I'm just sort of eyeballing it. I can flick which way the wall is drawing just by hitting spacebar. So at the moment, it's on one side. I hit spacebar, it flicks the wall over. And I'm just going to model these like so that looks pretty good okay so your task now is to draw these walls up to reflect the floor plan just roughly just eyeball it and then after that we're going to dimension them well firstly we need to create some more levels as well because some of these walls go up to a certain height while others don't and then we'll dimension them and then adjust the walls so we have the correct sizes because at the moment, like I said, you're just eyeballing, you're just drawing over the top of the floor plan. Um, next up, we want to dimension them correctly and then type in some rational dimensions. Before I can audit the walls and dimension them all up, I want to make sure that we have all the levels we need in our project going forward. So I've confirmed that the ground floor level is at the right level. The level one is currently where it sits, but we're going to add a few more levels in here. So to create new levels, I'm going to go up to the architecture tab and towards the end of it, you'll see that there are two datum items in the, um, sorry, two items in the datum ribbon. Uh, so there's level and grid. I'm going to click on level. Well, the shortcut as well is just LL on the keyboard. And now it prompts me to draw a level. So inside of that uh, north elevation, I can just click anywhere. So I'm going to click around here where it snaps to my cursor and then just come across like so. And you can see it picks up on the level, the last level named. So if I go again, it, this time it will be level three, like so. Graphically, I'm not too worried about how they look right now. Um, but what I do care are those heights. So I'm going to go ahead and dimension these as well, just so I've got the um, relevant height between them. So I'm going to go up to my Annotate tab and then just click on Align Dimension. And I'm just going to click on one, two, three, and four, and then just click off just there. Hit Escape a couple times, and let's just change some of these up. So at level one, I'm going to change the name of this level to Ground. CL, so ceiling level, hit enter and it's going to ask me would I like to change the name, would I like to rename the corresponding views. What that means is at the moment there already was some views created for level one. And you can see that in the project browser, 
that now we have, we've created those other levels, they've appeared here. So ground floor, level one, we made level two and level three and they've now appeared in the project browser because these views are automatically generated when you create a new level. I'm gonna say, yes, I would like to update that because if you keep an eye on the project browser, when I hit yes, they update to say ground CL and then ground floor. There's no more level one, at least for now. So I'm gonna change that height as well. So I'm gonna change that to 57350. Okay, so what that means is now we have a ceiling height of 2.7 meters. We're then going to have our ground floor, uh, sorry, our first floor, and I'm going to leave, or actually I'm going to work the other way down. So I'm going to click on level three. I'm going to call this one level 01 CL. Would I like to change the name? Yes, I would, at least for now. And then let's work backwards. So I reckon that's going to be 2.7 meters. So I can change the level either by clicking on the number and just plugging in a number, but that can be very hard because the, that number is a relative level. So it's not like a clean, you know, one to 10, 10 to 15. It's usually some random number. That's because of the relevant survey point. So that's why the dimensions are so helpful. I can change the dimensions um, just by typing in a number on the dimension. So what you need to do is you need to click on what is dimension. You don't click on the dimension, you click on what is dimensioning. So in this instance, it's dimensioning the level one ceiling level. So I click on that and now that number turns to blue and I can click on the number and type in, type in a number. So in this instance, I'm gonna say it's 2.7 meters, hit enter and the level comes down. Now the gap between here and here is massive. It's 4.6 meters essentially. I'm gonna bring both of these down. Well, what I'll do actually is I'm gonna click on this here. I'm gonna click this little tick box, this box here, click on that to bring up the name. I'm gonna call this one level 01. And I would like to rename, thank you. And then again, I'm gonna click on that level and I'm going to click on the number and then just type in, I reckon 450 is enough and then click on ceiling level one ceiling and then again go 2.7 meters there we go okay so what we have it might be hard to see at the moment is we got a ground floor plan a ceiling level for ground floor then we have a floor finish level for level one and then on the first floor we have the ceiling level for level one so that's our four levels that we're going to need for this project now why that's important because we need to change the heights of some of these walls um, relevant to their levels. Say the external walls, they go up probably to like level one because it's a facade wall. Um, but then the internal walls, they don't need to go to the underside of level one. They go to the ceiling level. Uh, so we'll have to audit those uh, shortly. So that's our levels confirmed in the project. These are the levels that we need. And from here, we'll go ahead and dimension our walls and clean those up and rationalize them. Okay, I've finished modeling all my interior and exterior walls for my ground level just by eyeballing them all. And in fact, at this point, I've already rationalized the dimensions too. To make it a little bit clearer, I'm just going to click on the background image and I'm going to use the command HH. So I hit HH and that temporarily hides the object that I've selected. And you can tell because that blue band comes around the outside of my modeling space saying temporary hide forward slash isolate. So I can get rid of that hide by going, uh, typing in the keyboard HR that brings back the items, hit and reveal. I'm um, gonna do that again, so click on it HH. But what it does mean as well is if I was to close the file and then open it again, those items would reappear. So they're not permanently hidden, they're just temporarily hidden. And that helps us just for clarity on what's going on here. So just a brief explanation of dimensioning within Revit. I'm gonna to go to my annotate tab and you can see in the ribbon, um, the palette or the panel for dimensioning is pretty vast. You have aligned dimensions, linear, angle, radial, um, diameter, and so on and so forth. We're just gonna stick with aligned. That's most of what we're going to need for this assignment in general. Um, and to bring that up, I can either click on the uh, I can either click on the command or I can just go DI on my keyboard and that brings up my dimension tool. And you can tell because next to my mouse, my cursor, I've got a little dimension mark. Like everything else in Revit, there are many different types of dimensions. So I can click on my properties window, click on the drop down box and you can see there's all these different types of dimensions that have already been created. And they'll be, the differences between these will be 
mostly graphical, how they appear, the size of the text, the size of the actual dimension itself. But you can also change like the color of it too. If there's a prefix or a suffix after the number, and you can also change the decimal placing. So if you want a dimension to the nearest round or whole number or down to like three three decimal places, I'm just going to leave the standard dimension tool for now. That's fine. So whichever one comes up as standard is good enough. Next up in this green ribbon underneath the um, palette or underneath the uh, main toolbar, um, you've got this uh, button here to change where I place the dimension. So face it. So I've got wall center lines, wall faces, center of cores, or faces of cores. This is why it was so critical when we were creating our walls that the walls are created in such that it's correct that the right elements are within the core boundary. The reason why is because it doesn't mean that I can't pick up other areas of the wall. It just means by default, it's going to find those elements first. So let's say if I go wall faces, what I've got in front of me is just a bunch of timber studs. I'm just going to go click once, click twice, click again, click again. The important thing to note is that 110 is appearing, which is the total thickness of the wall from the plasterboard on one side to the plasterboard on the other. As we know, timber studs are not dimensioned like this. You dimension them usually as 90 mil timber studs. And all of this has to do with the way that walls are actually constructed on site by a builder. Um, when the builder is erecting a frame or when your petition guys on a commercial site bring and um, putting up stud work, uh, they don't care what the thickness of the timber of what the plasterboard is at that point in time. They just need to know where to place the walls on, on, the, uh, on the concrete slab um, or on the flooring. <clears throat> so if I go back to DI, I go DI for bring up my dimension tool again. I'll change this now to faces of core. And you'll see now I'm just going to click once, click twice. And by default, it picks the core boundary, which is the 90 mil timber stud. That's why, again, it's so critical that our walls are created um, correctly. Uh, and again, it, I can still choose the other method. So hovering over that wall, I can hit tab on my keyboard and I will start cycling through selection options that are closest to my mouse. So I can go from there and I can hold my mouse over the other side of the wall and hit tab and then I'll pick up the other side of the plasterboard. So I can still pick 110. It's just by when I'm you know this far back from the drawing, which you generally are when you dimension, you're usually somewhere like this. I'm going to pick up the core boundary first. I can always just zoom in and make sure I select you know the, the, the line that I want, but this is pretty slow dimensioning like this. It's usually just easier to be further zoomed out and dimensioning away. You'll notice as well, we can, we can choose the other options too. So wall center line is pretty important or core faces, but generally wall center line is the one you would use here. So you just go bang and you can see you get like the little CL, the little center line mark. And this is really good again for like uh, partitions, whether it be like office partitions, like, uh, or maybe meeting rooms or apartment buildings. Uh, you just want to know where the center line of the wall is. Cause again, um, some builders, depending on the type of building, they'll just use some like uh, chalk spray and they'll just spray the center line of the wall and they'll put the uh, wall up from there. Other times they'll still do it to the faces of the studs or the faces of the core. And that is usually the better method to, to utilize. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my dimension tool. I'm going to pick spaces of core. That's going to be the main method in which we dimension. And you'll notice that when I use that method over my brick veneer wall, it by default picks the 240 thickness. It leaves out the plasterboard on the inside of that wall, which again is very common in how we denote a timber stud wall. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go one, two, three, four, and the other one like so in this uh, little sample, this little sample set of walls. And then I'm going to hit escape a couple times and then my dimension command is now complete. If I want to change the size of these rooms, let's call it, I don't click on the dimension. This is a very key uh, concept to get your head around. I don't click on the dimension. I click on what it's dimensioning. So this wall and this wall, that face and that face is giving me the number 1422. So if I want to change that length, I click on one of these walls and whichever one I click on is the one that will move. So when I click on it, now you'll see the dimension underneath that light, that number turns light blue and goes really small. I can click on that and I can type in whatever number I want. So I'll just type in say 1800 and hit spacebar or enter. 
And that wall moves out to be 1800 away from this wall. But if I click on this wall, I can adjust either one of these because both of those dimensions are referencing that wall. So if I make this one 1800, it's going to push it to the left and that's going to consequentially make this room smaller over here. So I can then click on this wall again and make that 1800 and now those are equal width rooms. So 90, 1800, 90, 1800, 90. Um, I can do the same thing over here. I can click on this wall and say, actually, I want uh, that to be only 1500 as an example. And that brings that back. The same works in the other direction. So if I want to make this room longer, all I got to do is I don't actually even have to dimension the entirety of the wall like so. All I need to do is just the inner reference. So I can just go bang, bang, and then click off into space and then hit escape a couple of times. And then again, just click on one of these walls and whichever one I click on is the one that's going to move. So if I click on this wall and I make that 3000, it's gonna make this room three meters long and both of those walls because it's the same wall, even though this one is intersecting the two of them. If I wanted to make these two different lengths, I would have to split the walls and disallow the join, but um, I'll go through that one shortly. So you're going to notice in my finished floor plan, I've dimensioned up almost everything. So the exterior I've dimensioned, which is to the finished face. That's very important to note because the faces of the interior is what's more important to me. But on the inside, it's all to the core. So for instance, the stairway, I've left a meter and a meter and then a 90 mil timber stud in between. But you'll notice if I zoom right in, that dimension is not taking into account the plasterboard. So the real width of that hallway from the plasterboard face to the plasterboard face, sorry, of the stair, is going to be 980 mil because the plasterboard is, is 10 mil in this instance, or it could be a 13 mil fire plasterboard or something like that. You know, it doesn't really matter. But the core boundary is the most important one here. So you can either reference these, draw these dimensions that I have here, or you can rationalize them yourself. It's up to you. These are just dimensions that make a lot of sense or make sense to me, which is close to, if I turn back on the background drawing, it's close to the drawing we see there, but pretty commonly, I mean, you can see here how far off that black wall is there compared to my wall, just because I've rationalized it. It's not miles off, but it's close enough. And this is pretty standard for, you know, if you were doing a design project and you had sketched out a floor plan, you can always just take an image of that on your phone and then load it into Revit and then just start tracing over it. And then in Revit, you can dimension the walls up and make them a rational size for whatever your design is meant to be or whatever your intended design is meant to be. The last step of the first tutorial is a small one, but actually really, really important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come down to the bottom of my modeling window and next to these little sunglasses here, I'm going to click the little light bulb. And what's going to happen is you're going to get this red uh, or burgundy border around the outside of your modeling window. And this is called Reveal Hidden Objects. The shortcut to that is RH. So if I go RH, it turns it on. RH turns it off. But what, uh, what this is, is this shows us elements that are permanently hidden in the view. So unlike temporary hide, this is elements that are permanently hidden. When I do that, you're going to see that um, even if you're sort of zoomed out, you have like this right angle, um, these two arrows at right angles, and then it looks like a circle and a triangle overlaid over each other. What they are is the origin point um, within Revit or different origin points within Revit. The red arrows that go up and to the right, that is known as Revit's internal origin. That's the zero zero of the model file. The triangle object is called a survey point. Let's see if I can select it. There we go. If I click on that, it's called an internal survey point. And then the circle is the project base point. Now, what these are um, can be an entire class within itself. And it's not really relevant to what we're doing here at Box Hill. But if you just are aware that those three different origin types inside Revit exist, you're already far ahead of the curve. Now, the reason why we have revealed the hidden objects is we want to expose these. We want to see these. And the reason why they are hidden is because you don't want them just sitting there in the middle of your model space because it's so easy for someone to pick them up and drag them. Even if they're pinned, it's very easy to still drag them accidentally and they will stuff your file up massively, especially if you're coordinating with other consultants and engineers um, or basically other BIM authors. But what we do want to do is move our building to the zero zero point. Um, this is kind of like how in Rhino we started off with the thing was like the laundry or the kitchen wall was at the zero zero point within Rhino. So we want to move our Revit model to a zero zero point. Um, 
So what we'll do is I'm just going to select everything we've done so far, including our background image. Now I'm going to make sure I unpin the background image. So I'm going to click on the background image and then click on the uh, unpin icon just up here in the in the modify panel. So that's now unpinned. So now I can move this around. Then I'm going to select everything that we've done so far, including all the dimensions. So I'm just going to go click on the right, um, click over here, click and drag from left to right. So it has to be everything within that box that's selected, making sure I don't pick up any sections or elevations as well. If I accidentally pick up something I don't want, so let's say for instance, I accidentally pick up this elevation marker just here, I can hold down shift on my keyboard. I get a little minus sign next to my mouse and I can just circle or just encompass that selection and then it removes it. What I am going to do next is I'm going to go move on my keyboard MV and I'm going to come down to this front corner of the garage I'm going to click on that front corner, zoom out and then just hover my mouse over the middle of the project base point. You can see I haven't clicked anything, I'm just holding my mouse there and that little um, icon comes up saying point. I click and now the project is perfectly placed at the zero zero point. When I zoom right in, you can see that the project base point and the internal origin is right on the corner of that garage. So that's the point in which the model will grow and shrink from. So if you need to do any adjustments on walls, you're not to adjust this wall and you're not to adjust this garage wall here. Basically everything else moves around those two and that makes a lot of sense because normally the garage wall would be on the boundary line of your property or at least on an easement of some sort. So that's the last step that we need to do. What we need, then what we'll do is we'll close or turn off the revealed hidden object. So I'm going to go RH my keyboard that turns it off or I can click on the little light bulb down here. You see the light bulb now is turned on and when I turn, when I click that off, the light bulb turns off. And then the last thing, I'm going to click on my image and pin that back because I want to make sure I don't accidentally, I'm not dragging it anywhere. So that's now good to go. To save our Revit project, I'm going to go up to file and then come down to save as. And under save as, we have an option. We have actually a number of options to save this file for different purposes. We can save it as a cloud model, which will then, as the name implies, save it to the cloud. We're not going to do that in this scenario, but it, nonetheless, it's a very interesting and unique concept um, that BIM softwares allow. We're going to save this as a project file, but just some of the other items there, we can save a family. This is not applicable because we're not in the family environment. We are in a project environment. That's why it's grayed out. We could save this as a template file, um, which is quite interesting and we will do that basically at the very end of our course and you can also save uh, a library so you can select items to then like save out into bulk folders for later use which is a really good tool as well but for now I'm just going to to project and click on that and then like with everything else it will prompt you you know go to navigate where you're going to save the project um, in this regard, um, we should be naming it in, in accordance with the assessment task uh, cover sheet. So that would be AT4 underscore your initials underscore the, your student number. And very, very important, make sure you go underscore R and then the Revit version you're using. So for me, that's Revit 2020. So that would be R20. But if you're using Revit 22, that would be R22. That is because one very big flaw of Autodesk Revit project files is that they don't tell you which version they're saved in. But if you were to use a later version, so let's say um, someone saved their project as Revit 2022, I would then open up Revit 20 and try and open up the file and I would get an error saying that this version is a later version than what I'm currently using. Not a massive deal because I can just open it and then go find that file, but it's much easier if it's saved in the name. I'm then going to come down to my options button just here click on that and the backups I think for yourself to begin with might be as high as 20. So change those backups just to one. You have to have at least one backup, but trust me, if you have 20 there, you're going to end up with so many Revit files. You'll have the original Revit file and then the Revit file dot zero 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 one all the way through to like say zero zero twenty. You can save a hundred backups if you want. No idea why you would. One backup is more than enough. Underneath that are, are components to do with work sharing, which we are not doing, so that's fine. Then we have the thumbnail preview. That's just you know the, when you have thumbnails turned on in, in File Explorer, what is showing. And to be honest, for now, it doesn't matter. I'm going to click OK and then hit Save. And then that is the project now saved. So I'll now do that. I'll save that here. 
And you'll notice straight away at the top of the screen, you'll have Autodesk Revit, the version, and then the file name above that. So I know which file that I'm currently in. In summary, in this first tutorial, we covered the process of opening up and creating a new Revit project, importing the floor plans as a JPEG image, rescaling them and pinning them. We created all the levels that we're going to need for the project. We created some new wall types, not all, but some of the wall types that we required. We went through the process of drawing our walls. We went through adjusting and rationalizing room sizes via the dimensions tool and we move the entire project to Revit's project base point at the zero zero mark. So before next class, what you wanna have done by uh, that time will be all external and internal walls on the ground floor. Essentially every wall on the ground floor should be completed, ready to go for the next, for the next um, tutorial.